gotta, because today we are homesick. <laughs> we are homesick today, right? Good morning. morning. Happy Sunday. Y'all glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Guess what? I got something to tell you. He's coming back. Soon. (laughs) Uh, Yes. We got to pray, right? Let's pray for Israel. Lord, pray for our country because we're in trouble now that... Our country decided to turn its back on Israel. So anytime a country does that, we're in trouble. So pray (laughs) a lot, right? Um, So really quick, birthdays. Do we have any birthdays out there coming up? Anybody? We got, oh, Miss Deb. We got a few. All right. Okay, Miss Susie. You. All right, get your pencils and papers out. I got a lot to announce, so take notes. Y'all ready for this? (laughs) Um, We have Mr. Joe here, did an amazing job. He like scraped our back lot and stuff back here and that, but he needs help with some things after church. There's some, still some weeds and stuff he couldn't get with um, the skidster and stuff. And, and, um, you know, he's got kind of a messed up back, too. So if anybody's willing to stay after today and help him real quick, get some of that just picked up and out of the way, we would appreciate it. It looks great. Give Joe a big hand, guys. <laughs> Woohoo! We love Joe, Joe. Also, um, 
Don't forget that we have WMs, and, I'm, and we'll announce that in a minute. Miss Brenda's going to come up and talk about that, what God's been leading her to do with us. So uh, we'll give her just a minute. But don't forget, we have Bible studies throughout the week, tonight at 630 over there at Brother Chris and Sister Deb's house. They've got a Bible study going on at 6.30. Tuesdays at Mike's at 1 o'clock and then 7 o'clock with Pastor Stacy. Wednesday we have youth group and Bible study here. That starts at 6.30. Come on down. And then Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. on Facebook, J Sisters Bible Study. Go and like that page. You can always go back and watch the replays. There's also there's tons of opportunities to study God's Word throughout the week. Be, you know, So get in your Word. That's important. That's how you discern the truth from the lies. If you don't have the truth in you, you're going to fall for all the lies and all the sound good preachers out there that, you know, you realize when they do that, it's 95% truth and 5% false. Isn't that what Satan does? Didn't he do that with Eve in the garden? Right? So if you don't have the word in you to discern that, you're going to fall. So get your word in you. And not only on your own time, but it's important to do it corporately, too, with other people. Join in and learn that way as well. We have our Passover dinner coming up on April 19th. Be here at 6.30 for that. That's going to be an amazing time. And, of course, we'll feed you, right? And so uh, we're going to have that here. And then coming up on May 2nd, I know it's a little bit of ways, but we've all been praying for Peyton Arnold. Um, he's 12, right? 12 years old, and he's battling leukemia. Um, we're having a big fundraiser, dinner, pasta, bingo, all kinds of fun stuff at the Crossroads Center. I forgot to write down the time, but that is on May 2nd, and there's going to be all sorts of things going on to help raise money for this little boy that is battling leukemia. So let's all join in on that. And then um, Children's Church, we need help in children's church and in our nursery. We're trying to get things going and enough people who are interested in teaching little children. Come on, raise your hand. Everybody wants to teach little kids. Come on. Let's see those hands. No, I'm not the only one. Come on. Um, <laughs> anyways, with our children's church, which is ages 4 to 11 or 12. I can't remember. Anyways, 11 or 12, 4 to 11 or 12. And then if we have one more person who is willing to sign up, um, you'll only have to teach once a month. And we have this cool new curriculum. It's called the Bible Engagement Project that we are using. And so it'll be a lot of fun. I promise you. Come and teach children's church, they said. You'll grow. I promise. I'm okay. So this morning, I'm, I'm this, this is how God works with me. I'm in there. I'm trying to have my husband help me hook stuff up. Nothing's working. I'm getting frustrated, impatient, overwhelmed. And I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, Jet, he's back there. I'm like, and one of our lessons we did a while back and we hung them on the wall was the fruit of the spirit. And they had to take a bunch of them down to hang our new TV. We got a new TV in Children's Church. Woohoo! And the only part they left up, I'm all sitting there, I'm getting overwhelmed. I'm about ready to cry, seriously. And I'm like, I look up and it says, the fruit of the spirit is patience. <laughs> Not kidding. I'm like, Lord, you surely have a sense of humor. <laughs> okay, okay, I got the point, God. I'll breathe, it'll be okay. It'll all work out. I know. Patience. Right? So is that literally legit happened like an hour ago. So. <laughs> right? So anyways, we need a person. And then also we are trying. We have a lot of, for a long time we didn't have a lot of littles. But now we have a lot of littles that need to go in our nursery. And we need people. And so Miss Dolores back there, right, right there, she has a sign-up sheet. And same thing, if you're willing to work in the nursery, if we have enough people, you only have to do it like once a month. And go back there and hang with the cutest little babies and play with them. And yes, you might have to change a diaper, but we've got the stuff back there to help you. And so all of that is, is ready to go. So please, if you're interested in any of those departments, see Dolores for the nursery or see Jennifer right here for Children's Church. Okay, and we can get you started. And, and or what will happen with children's church, you'll probably have to hang with one of us for a few lessons to kind of see how it goes. And then it's all yours. 
that's how that works. <laughs> Anyways, okay, Mama, come on up. She's going to talk to you guys about WMs, which is this Saturday at 11, and what God put on her heart, and a cool way that the, how he confirmed it to her. So she's going to tell you all about that. Okay, uh, last month after we had WMs, on the way home, I just felt really, really heavy about praying for our children. And sorry, <laughs> this is emotional, but... So I talked to Debbie and I says, I think we just need to have a prayer meeting, invite the women and stuff, and, and pray for our kids in this country. Not ours, but everybody knows how crazy it out there, is out there. Some kids think they don't even know they're human, half of them, you know, and, or what gender they are, or the woke stuff. It's really nasty time to go up. And I don't know if you remember, but in, in um, the Bible, it talks about when, when Babylon come, and Nebuchadnezzar and that come and took over Jerusalem. Well, who did they took? They took the young people. They didn't take the old people. They already knew they were set in their way. But they took the young, and they changed a generation. And I think that's what Satan's trying to do now. And so, uh, anyway, on the way home last week from work, I was listening to the radio, and I heard the thing about praying for children. It's called, Don't, You Can't Have My Kids. And so, in all 50 states at the Capitol, in every 50 states, women are gathered, and men, to pray for this generation, to pray for our kids, to pray that to stop the enemy from stealing all of our children. And so that's what I want to do. I want to join with them. We'll have our WMs and that, and it's fasting and prayer. So if you'd like to fast before you come, you can. If not, we'll have stuff for sandwiches or whatever. But I'd like to invite you to pray for the children, to pray for this generation, to pray for God to roll back the darkness and open our kids' eyes, because we're losing them. We are, and it's sad, and it breaks my heart. And so Saturday... This Saturday, come and ready to pray. Come ready to pray. Come prayed up for you even get here. And, and let's see, God, God, you know, it's so overwhelming. None of us know where to start. I don't know where to start, but I know to start on my knees is the right place to start. And that's what we need to do. So I invite even men, if you want to come, you're welcome to come because they're your kids too. Okay? The cool thing she forgot to tell you is this whole time, she's like, okay, we're doing it at WMs. And then when she heard that on the radio, they're like, April 13th, we're doing this at the Capitals. She's like, wow, I wonder what day April 13th is. Maybe we can, she looked at it, it was WMs. She's like, oh, that, see, God was already putting it on her heart. Isn't that awesome? All oh, right, it's all yours, it. old man. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. I appreciate it so much. Uh, does this pulpit make me look look older because it's you know dark gray kind of cool. uh, No, uh, yeah, very important that we take care of our kids, and and that's 100% right. Satan is after our our kids, has been for a long, long time, but now it's kind of like the steps, the attacks have been stepped up incredibly, astronomically, really. So uh, definitely, let's be in prayer. I, I will be out of the area that day, but. Uh, but uh, it, men, please come, and also it's okay to come and, and pray with these with these women. So, all right, praise the Lord. Children's Church, uh, did I say that right? Come on. Children's Church. Uh, by the way, if you missed, uh, um, usually we have the first uh, Saturday of the month is men's breakfast, okay? So just write that in your little iPod or whatever you do phone, whatever. Write it down as a reminder because it's really cool. We have a great time. Uh, usually we have a, a really good breakfast meal put together. Usually Greg cooks for us and does a wonderful job, but he was out and the women stepped up again, stepped up to the plate and did a wonderful, wonderful job. It was awesome. Biscuits and gravy and sausage and egg casserole and just, it was great. So we thank you, Brandon and Jess and all of you guys. It's fantastic. So what we're going to have to do, men, step up, because not this Saturday, but maybe for May, because it's Mother's Day, May kind of time, maybe the men can step up and fix the women something Amen. for a luncheon. <laughs> men, come on. Who wants to raise their hand and start volunteering? <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to make me grab Greg and, 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 and torture him until he says yes. I right? know. But, uh, but there's some good cooks out there. We have some good cooks in this. So let's do something for the women. There. So I'm committing you guys right now, committing you guys ahead of time. And it's not going to be McDonald's, okay? They won't, they won't put up with that. Uh, praise the Lord. Well, uh, a couple of things I want to mention. First of all, 
is uh, definitely be in prayer for, uh, for Israel. Uh, so many things are going on uh, behind the scenes, and what you see in the news isn't always what's really happening. And please don't take the world's opinion on this, because they have no clue what's really happening. Israel it does an incredible job trying to protect innocent people, like amazingly tries to protect innocent people. There's always casualties in, in wartime, especially when you have a cowardly uh, force like Hamas. Hamas is not a military thing, it's a terrorist organization. And they, they use people as human shields, they do all kinds of horrible, horrible things to uh, force people to be in harm's way. And then when one of them gets hurt, they publicize it as Israel is committing genocide. That is the furthest thing from the truth. So uh, realize that the Israeli army probably does a better job. And I'm an American citizen. I believe our army, our units are the best there ever was, ever will be. They're amazing. They're better than anything, right? But when it comes to preserving innocent life, Israel, hands down, beats everybody. Amen. So understand that. So when you hear this garbage on the news that Israel's committing genocide, it's all, it's all, it's all lies. All of it, 100%. Israel is God's land, okay? It's promised to them. 2,000 years ago, they were driven from their land, right? And outlawed to be there. Actually, literally outlawed to be there. They were spread up all over the place, into northern uh, Europe, all over the place, into Spain, everything. Persecuted every step of the way. Every step of the way. Tried to be destroyed. Their book, their religion, their language, everything. Tell me that God isn't involved, because 2,000 years later, or 1940, or 1900 years later, here they are in the land again, 1948, right? They, get their, they got their language back, they have their, their, their religion practiced and ready to go, even though they practiced it wherever they were, and they united, got their nation back. That is unheard of. Anywhere, when a people group gets wiped out or moved out of the area, they never come back and, and take it. Israel's the only one, and it's been a blessing to the whole area and to the whole world. Medically speaking, the advances in medicine, technology, your cell phones, guess what? Where do you think they came from? Israel. Technology is Israel. Your GPS on your, on your car will take you wherever you want to go. Where do you think that technology came from? Israel. So everything that you see, really, Israel has its hands on it. Medicine and technology and everything else. Plus, they keep us in line in, in, the, in the Middle East. They're the only democracy. In, you know, it's the size of New Jersey, which is tiny, by the way, if you haven't been back east. New Jersey's really tiny. And every nation around it has a gazillion more square, square miles than Israel does. It, Israel's the one that's taking over land. I don't know how that works, but they're not doing a very good job. The bottom line is that uh, all these nations around them want to destroy them, want to kill them, want to eradicate them, push them from the river to the sea. And that is a total, total anti-Semitic garbage. And guess what? After that, they're coming for us. So, so understand that. So we need to protect the Jewish people. We need to, to raise up the, 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 the nation of Israel in prayer. They don't do everything perfect, but they try to do the best they can. And we need to pray that, uh, that the lies are diminished and that the truth comes out. In this battle, right, uh, truth is our weapon. Truth is our weapon. And facts are our ammunition. Just remember that. Just lay that down whenever that comes up. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about that. And I can't believe the people I run into that think that, oh, well, they're doing this wrong. They're doing... No, they're not. If you really knew what was going on, you wouldn't say that. Anyway, uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about, tomorrow, tomorrow, April 8th, right? Tomorrow? Yeah, the eclipse. Mm. Going over all these towns that have biblical names, and so therefore, all these towns in the Midwest. So tell me something. Uh, there's preachers on TV, there's all kinds of things on the YouTube saying that this is the end of the world, and that Christ is coming back, and that there's all these things are going to happen. Look. Things happen all the time. There was an earthquake in New Jersey the other day. Unheard of, right? New Jersey never gets earthquakes. So is that part of the deal? No, but if it happened afterwards or during, oh, that would be the end of the world. Tsunamis, all this different stuff. Listen, stuff happens 
all the time. And we can connect all kinds of different things to constellations, to different things. Oh, it's, it's Sunday, therefore, you know, uh, somebody got sunburned at Sunday. Yeah. You know, you can do all kinds of gymnastics with that stuff. But let me tell you something. In, in the Bible, it talks about that there's going to be signs in the skies and the moon and the sun, right? There's going to be these signs, and there's going to be darkness, right? Then the, the sun's going to turn black like, sudden, like cloth and, right? and blood and all this other stuff. Look, it didn't work with the blood moons, right? That was all ridiculous, too. And I told you that early on, before all that stuff. And, and this is the same thing. The Bible is not talking about four-minute eclipse across the Midwest. It's talking about a total darkness all over all the land, basically, for a long time. Right? When Jesus died, there was darkness for more than four minutes. Hello? So really understand, it has nothing to do with it. Don't pay attention. Astronomically speaking, in other words, if you're into astronomy, into observing and how stars and things move and orbits and all that, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great thing to, to watch and say, I was there, I saw it, I saw partially, because we're not going to see all of it here. Great to be able to do that, but bottom line is, this has an, in, no prophetic relevance whatsoever. So this thing about eclipses and all that, look, it, it comes and goes every single time, and just forget about it. Right? Can you say that with me? Forget about it. There you go. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this day. I ask that you help us today with your word and uh, help us to be able to just uh, understand exactly the times and how close we are and how much we need to pay attention to you and that your promises that you made to us. And I just ask, Lord, today that you would just help us to grow in, in, in grace and the knowledge of you and to be able to trust you even more and to be excited about your coming, Lord, about your return, about your, about your rescuing us, Lord. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Much, much turmoil, as I said, in, in our world today. There's uh, all kinds of problems going on. If we start focusing on the problems that are out there in the world, uh, we'd never get to, uh, we'd never go to work. We'd never go see our grandkids. We'd never go see our kids. It'd be like, uh, you can't leave the TV, you know. So don't, don't uh, fall for too much of that. But there's ever-increasing issues, and ever-increasing issues are going to keep going on and on and on until the end, right? We have to understand that. But we must stay vigilant. Stay vigilant. Stay awake. Stay strong on what matters the most. And what matters the most is keeping our eyes on Jesus. Amen. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, like I told you many times before, and I heard it from somebody else, and I'll say it and repeat it, Jesus is not coming back on Air Force One, okay? So just understand that. It's, it's, uh, keep our eyes on Jesus, on what he said, on his promises that he made, on what he's going to do, the things that he's going to do when he does return, amen? The things he's doing right now behind the scenes and what he's going to do when he comes back. And what he wants us to do is the other thing that we need to pay attention to. What does he want me to do? What does he want you to do? How does he want us to respond to these things? So Jesus told us many, many times to stay alert. He said, stay alert, stay awake, don't get drunk, you know, don't sleep, <laughs> stay awake and, and watch for things, watch for my coming, watch for, be ready for the things that are going to bring us to his, uh, to his uh, side. Uh, it's to stay alert, stay awake, be ready for his coming, be ready. We must live our lives and do what we do every day. We can't be like, well, Jesus is coming. I'm going to go to the bunker. I'm going to shut myself in until he comes, or I'm going to go up to the mountains and, and, and quit my job and quit my, you know, everything and just go hide out until he comes. No, you know, we'd, we'd be there. Who knows? We might be there another six months. We might be there another week. We might be there another day. We might be there another 10 years. We don't know. We have to live our lives as if he's not coming back for 50 years, right? in the sense of making plans, getting married, going to college, whatever your plans are. But we have to be ready as if he's coming back right now. Right? So that's, that's the, the, the key here. You can plan ahead and do all these kind of things, but when it comes to being ready, we have to be ready like, like right now. Right? So, so keep in mind his return. Always keep in mind his return. One thing I love about new believers, and when they get, the, when they get a grip on... on that he's coming back and that he's going to come get us or whatever, is that they're always looking up. They're always looking at the, at the eastern sky, looking to see if he's, 
is that, you know, they hear a noise, you know, thunder, credit, you know, is that it? Is that today? Or they hear a loud blast from something, you know, is that, is that it, you know? And uh, uh, the clouds look really funky sometimes, don't they? Sometimes clouds look really weird. You ever see those clouds that look like upside down muffins? Everybody see that? I came out of the grill one time. It's been like 10 years ago. I came out of the grill and it was this guy had these little muffins. It looked like upside down pan of muffins. It made me hungry. I went back in. <laughs> no, <just kidding. laughs> but, um, but, but if you will show this, the chart. Now, I know this is a terrible chart because it's the only one I can find that's simple. Uh, there's a lot of charts out there that are, uh, that, are, that are a lot more complex than this, right? They have all these different things on it. And I could really freak you out and show you one of the Larkin's charts that are, have all the faces of all the beasts and everything. But we're not going to do that. We're going to show a really simple one. And what this, uh, what this chart does is, where's my laser? It didn't go. Where's, it's nowhere. Anyway, um, so the, what, what this chart does is explain a little bit something here. So before Jesus came, Jesus came lived a life, 33 and a half years, and, uh, and, le- and left his disciples here on earth. He went to the cross, of course. And, and died on the cross, and of course we 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 uh, celebrated that last time with the with the uh, celebration of his rising from the dead. He rose from the dead and and created the church age basically. Now he went up again to heaven, Acts chapter one. He went back up to heaven, and he left us here to do business, and that's what he left his disciples to do and everything, and they did, and the church grew and grew over the years, over the centuries. And, uh, and we're expecting at any time now, right, that that, that time will be over and that he's coming back to get us. So that would be what they call, we call the rapture. We call it the rapture. It's actually a return of Christ before the tribulation. The tribulation is a period of time that's set aside for this earth, right, that is incredibly challenging, if you will. I mean, it's, a, it's an impossibility to be able to survive it. The, 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 the cataclysmic events, especially of the last three and a half years, are just unsurvivable. And, uh, and there are people that are going to survive, but it's going to be very, very difficult for that to happen. So you have to understand that it's a very, very difficult time. You don't want to be here. Um, it, it, the devil is going to be just rampaging through the, the land. The Antichrist is going to rule. It's going to be a one-world system. The, you know, it's going to be horrible when, when you're here. Anyway, so please don't be here. Trust in Christ today so you don't have to be here at least, okay? And so, so there's the tribulation of seven years, and then Christ returns at the end of that seven years on a white horse, Revelation 19.11, my favorite verse. <laughs> and he comes back, and then from there... Uh, it starts the millennial reign, what we call the millennial reign. Millennial means a thousand. So a thousand year reign on earth, peace on earth, whole new management system. Uh, the, the, the rivers are going to be uh, controlled so that uh, if there's no flooding in St. Louis, but there's going to be uh, uh, green uh, pastures in Nevada. You know, <laughs> it's gonna, The desert's going to bloom, there's going to be fruit and this and bounty everywhere and, and no sickness, no disease. The devil's going to be bound for a thousand years. So for a thousand years, the devil's going to be chained up. And that means his authority, his demons, all his influences, evil spirits, all that will be tied up, won't be able to do any harm. After the thousand years, he gets released again for a short time. And we find that at that point, that a lot of people follow the devil again, right? And then Jesus comes back. I mean, Jesus wipes them out, just totally wipes them out and and gets rid of them, and then we have eternity, or the eternal state, or have new heaven, new earth. We have a new earth that comes down, and we get it all remodeled, and everything works out. But let me go back to the church age. So here we are in the church age. We're eagerly awaiting the return of Christ. Now, there's several different views of this, and I don't have them out here. I just wanted to basically tell you that's our view here, pretty much the view of most evangelical Christianity believes this. And that's that we have a church age, we have a rapture that happens before the tribulation. In other words, Jesus comes to get us before the tribulation starts. And then he comes back before the millennium, rules during the millennium, and then, of course, from there on forevermore. And that's kind of like our view, which means pre-millennial return of Christ, right? And pre-tribulation return of Christ. So pre-trib, pre-mill, that's what we are, okay? 
Now, there's some people that believe that Jesus is not going to rapture us before the tribulation, that we have to go through partial part of the tribulation. Some people believe in what they call a mid-trib uh, uh, position. And some people believe in a pre-wrath position, which is before the real stuff starts to happen. Okay, whatever. And some people believe he doesn't come until the very end of the tribulation. He just comes once at the end. That's it. And that's post-trib. It doesn't matter. I don't even like post-toasties. That's an old joke, but that's okay. But anyway, um, so what, what happens is this, is that a lot of times Christians will divide over these things. And they'll say, well, when you go to that church, they believe in pre-mill and pre, uh, pre-trib. Well, I don't believe that. Well, okay, well, it's not a, one of those doctrines that is so important that we have to divide over. If you're here and you believe in post-trib, praise the Lord, right? If you're here and believe in mid-trib, praise the Lord. You're still my brother. You're still my sister. It doesn't matter, right? But, of course, Assembly God Church that we are, we're going to teach pre-trib, pre-mill, because that's what we do, That's right? So, so understand that, that there is some different views, and then there's more views than that. There's ones that believe that there's no uh, tribulation whatsoever. We're in the millennium right now. Did you know we were in the millennium and Satan's bound? <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell that to the news people, right? <laughs> With all the murders and things that are going on. But so, so you know, and some people believe that there is no millennium. They're called amillennialists. They just, they don't believe in anything. They just believe, oh, it's okay, we're whatever. We just exist. We do the best we can. And then God will eventually one day reward us. <laughs> but that's not what Scripture tells us. And we have to go off of what Scripture tells us, not what we think Scripture tells us, not what we want Scripture to tell us, but what it actually tells us. So my scripture today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, very familiar piece of scripture for most of you. And, um, and I'll just read it through and then we'll go back and dissect it a little bit later. We've got other things to do before that. It's, but we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren. The King James says ignorant. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. A lot of people grieve when some, there's a death. And, and it's understandable to grieve because you miss them, because they're not here, they're, they're, they're missing, right? But to understand that when you're a Christian, you have hope that you're going to see them again. Uh, this life here is just that quick, instantly, it's done. And next thing you know, you're in heaven for eternity. And the real life is there, not here, okay? This is just motel earth, as we always say. So verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, understand these words, highlight them, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So where are they right now? With him. Okay? (laughs) Just so you know that. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, the Bible says. Okay? Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, with authority, with the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's us. Roosevelt, you're the dead in Christ. You can rise first. Another old joke, but that's okay. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And this is therefore comfort one another with these words. The NLT says encourage each other with these words, right? So so we have to understand that there's this pre-mill, pre-trib situation in which the Lord will come back and, and receive his own and come and get his own. Where else do we have that? Well, we know that Jesus is coming back from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And if we can bring those up really quick, it'll say, no problem. No problem. No problem. It's no problem for me, man. Take it easy. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And when it comes up, we'll read it again. Verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus talking at the Last Supper, by the way. In my Father's house 
right? God the Father, are many dwelling places. We talked about this last week. It's like, it's like a communal thing. It's like a giant communal area, right? But done the right way, not like a commune with a bunch of hippies on it. And I used to be constant. I used to kind of be a hippie. I'm a recovering hippie. I'm a recovering liberal. I admit to these things. I do. You know, I grew up in liberal commie land. I can't help it. And my father says, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go prepare a place for you. Verse 3, if I go prepare a place for you, I, Jesus, right, will come again and receive you to myself. Okay? And the NLT is, is I will come get you. I like that. I'm coming to get you. That, that where I am, there also you may be. You know, it's, like, it's like wherever Jesus is, we're going to be. Right? And that's an exciting thing to understand, that he's, he promised us he's coming back. He didn't just say that and just say, well, you know, that's just for my disciples here. No, it's for everybody that believes in him. To as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Right? If you trust in Christ today, or any day, that you put your faith in Christ and surrender to him, confess your sins to him, repent, Guess what? When that trumpet blows, you're going. Amen. It used to be an old song like that. It was really good. So, so we are his bride. We have to understand that we, we are just not a, a bunch of people that you know, make up this group, this denomination or whatever. It's not. not it's it's cross-denominational. It's not the Assemblies of God or the Baptists or the Presbyterians, it's, 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 it's anybody that trusts in Christ. Anybody. Now, when I'm talking about anybody that trusts in Christ, I'm talking about the Christ of the Bible. The, the Christ revealed. Because there's all kinds of different Christs out there. The Bible says many Christs are going to come. Many people are going to come proclaiming not only that, but be giving you systems to believe in things. That, you know, the Muslims believe in Christ. Did you know that? But like I told you last week or two weeks ago, that he is the one that comes back and, and, and helps the, the Mahdi or the or the, uh, the, the Islamic Christ, kill all the Christians and the Jews. So the Islamic Christ, right, it, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he raised from the dead because they believe he didn't die. He believed that Judas traded places with him on the cross at the last minute. And Judas was crucified and died. But Jesus didn't raise from the dead. He never died. He just went into hiding, like the 12th Iman, like the... Like the, the the Antichrist Christ that's coming, not the Antichrist, the, the, the Muslim Christ that's coming at the end with a sword and kill everybody. Jesus is his main henchman. Now, is that the Jesus of the Bible? No, of course not. You know, every major religion out there, world religion, believes that there's a Jesus or that there's some kind of a Jesus character, right? But we have to look at the true Jesus that's in the Bible revealed in scripture, not somebody's imagination. So we have Jesus is coming back. We have that, we have that, that, uh, that, um, that, that he died for us. He, we're his bride. He loves us. He didn't just die for a bunch of people. He died for those that are his. And he bought us. He bought us. You and me. He paid the price. How much money? Well, in drops of blood. That's how he paid for us. He paid for us with, with, with blood money, with his blood. And he loves us, and we're his body, by the way. The Bible calls that we're his body. The church is not just a building or whatever. You and I, all of us together, are part of the body of Christ. He's the head. We're his hands, his feet, his arms. We're the ones that are supposed to go reach out and hug somebody who's hurting. We're the ones that are supposed to feed the, with our hands, be the, the ones that can't feed themselves. We're the ones supposed to go places where the gospel isn't and preach it and teach it. We're the ones that have a mouth to speak the words of Christ and have ears to hear and empathize with what's going on in in the world around us to be able to reach out and help somebody. So he wants to protect us from, from the great tribulation. He doesn't want to keep us from tribulation because that would be ridiculous because there's no way to keep people from tribulation, regular tribulation. There's no way to keep people from persecution Right? He says, if you believe in me, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. 
And the New Testament says, if you live godly for Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Not maybe if, maybe if you're in the right place, wrong place, wrong time. No, you will suffer persecution. And that's true. And so are we going to be free from that? No. Is the climate in the United States going Canada way, where it's going to be illegal for me to stand up here and say that there's two genders? There's a man and a woman. And anything else is, you may be confused, but that's the facts. And as Ben Shapiro says, you know, biology doesn't care about your feelings. You know, that's just the way it is. And I'm not making fun of the people that are, that are, that are trapped in that. I, I feel for them, but I'm not going to lie to them and say, yeah, well, you know, it's okay. No, there's two genders. We'll help you. We'll love you. We'll care for you. We'll pray for you. We'll treat you less like anybody else. But there's two genders. I'm not changing that. But climate in the United States is going the other way. Pretty soon you'll see me in orange with a number on my shirt. I look good in orange anyway, but not really. You know, or, or white or whatever it is these days. But, uh, but so we're his body, and he died for us, and he wants to protect us from the great tribulation, but not from the many tribulations or many persecutions. We're going to probably suffer those things. Let me hurry on as they go. So today he wants us to be ready. He warns us to be ready. He says, please, please be ready, right? And he's coming like a thief in the night. What's one scripture that really stick, stuck with me before I got saved? I heard that scripture, and I went, hmm, that's weird. You know, coming like a thief in the night, you know, it's this last minute, you know. Matthew chapter 24 is where we want to go next. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 37. <clears throat> It says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. If you remember, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and God told him to build an ark because there's going to be a flood coming. It's going to destroy every living thing that's on earth, that creeps on the earth or walks on the earth. Everything that has breath in its lungs is a goner, except for maybe the whales. They made it, maybe. But for, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark. So it was business as usual. It was like, let's have a party, let's do this, let's relax, let's go here, let's let's travel, let's go to Cancun, let's go, you know, let's just have a good time, you know, it doesn't matter, right? And it's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your life, do what you got to do. But that's the way it was, right? Up until when? Until the door shut on the ark. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, hmm, raindrop. But that wasn't it. It was the great floods from the deep that, that, that devastated the earth. Earthquakes that left fissures that are miles and miles deep. Grand Canyon, somebody flushed the toilet. I'm telling you right now, that's what it was. It happened in, in days, if not hours, what, what you see there. But if you own oh, billions of years, no, no, it happened like that fast, okay? And the, the evidence is there, so don't, it will go another day. But, but uh, so they did not understand. It's in verse 39. It says, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it'll be such an instant thing. The rapture of the church will affect so many different areas. It'll affect, you know, the, the military, because there's a lot of people in the military, especially in our country and, it's, and some other countries that are, that are believers. And if you take them out, especially in leadership, things are like disconnected for a while. You have airline pilots. You have you know, people in, in everyday work stuff that aren't going to be there. The president of the bank, the guy that holds your passwords. Oh, oh, no, sorry, I don't know what happened to your money. <laughs> the guy that was in charge, he disappeared. His clothes are right there. No, it's just in the movie. <laughs> I don't want to go up to to heaven without anything. Lord, just at least change my clothes like you changed me, okay? Just give me new clothes. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's going to be disrupt city. Everything's going to be disrupted. And, and just imagine just millions of people just disappearing, what it's going to do to, to everything. It's going to be chaos. Of course, they're going to explain it away like UFOs came and took the bad people away, the people that are hurting our planet. They took them away because they're hurting our planet, you know, the evil Christians, you know. And they're going to explain it away, make some kind of excuse, but it's still going to be a mess. But from there on end, hey, guess what? Tribulation time. You know, put on the afterburners and look out because it's coming really bad. Read Revelation. You'll get a, a, a glimpse. 
uh, verse 40, then there will be uh, two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. In other words, here you have two people in the field and you have people uh, in the mill. You have people working during working hours. Maybe that in another scripture says two people be sleeping in a, in a bed together, not necessarily doing what you think, but just sleeping, you know, like with brother and sister or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, boof, one of them's gone. So it could happen at night or it could happen during the day. It could happen at work or it could happen just walking down the field. All of a sudden, where'd Charlie go? <laughs> you know, he's gone. And so... Um, You've got to be ready for his coming. Verse 30, 42 says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. If you knew what, when somebody's going to come try breaking into your house, guess what? You're going to be ready to go for that situation. Verse 44, for this reason, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you don't think he will. Now, tell me something. If he's coming at the end of the tribulation, right, the end of the seven years, we can gauge that by a lot of things because there's a lot of milestones along the way that Jesus know about because actually in, in chapter 24, the same chapter, he spoke about it, right? This is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then of course you have all the prophetic stuff. So it's like, oh, okay, that happened. Okay, so we got, mm, we got a good three years left before he comes. Okay. And this happened. Okay, we got a good, uh, good year and a half before he comes. We can still party and have a good time. Okay, man, we better get ready because now we're expecting him. No, he says you're, he's coming at an hour when you don't think he's going to come. Now, nowhere in the Bible, especially in the tribulation period, whether you read it in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, or you read in the Old Testament, books of Zechariah, and Joel, and Nahum, and all that, does it ever say that things will get better, and that there'll be peace on earth, everything will be fine at the end of the tribulation? It doesn't say that. It says it is cataclysmic nightmares. Asteroids, things, you know, just things blowing up. It's going to be not fun at all. So tell me that you are going to figure things out if you're looking at him to come at the end of the tribulation. Yeah, you will. But if he becomes before the tribulation, you don't know when. And it kicks it off. The clock starts ticking after that. So we have the doctrine what we call imminency. Imminency, which imminent return. It's like any time now. Any time now. Any time now. The early church lived like that. I mean... All the, the disciples, the, the, the writers of the New Testament, all believed that any day now, any day now. And you can say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Where's the promise of his coming? I think Peter talks about that. <laughs> right? don't, be, don't be stupid. Right? Any time now, he could come. And it'll be cataclysmic because the effects will just start right away. And the early church had a word for it. Uh, it, it it's, a, it's a word that we use for music now. But Maranatha. It's an Aramaic word. And it, and it really means just like, Lord come or is the Lord here? It's like, is he here? Is he, did you, is it, is he, <laughs> it's like anticipation. You're always like anticipating him being right here. And that's what I want you to be. I want you to be sensitive to, to this thing. I want you to be sensitive to where when you hear a thunderclap, when you... When you see the sunrise a little weird, or the, or the sunset a little weird, or you see clouds in a weird formation, I want you to be like, <gasps> like that. I want you to be like that. That's what he wants you to be. Like, I wonder, today the day? Oh, I can't wait. Is today the day? Right? You have no fear when you're, when you're a Christian. You want him to come. You're tired of this mess. You're tired of seeing the news and garbage and people getting abused and bad things happening to good people. You're tired of diseases and cancers and 12-year-old kids with leukemia. You're tired of that. You want them to come, straighten things out, amen? Be prepared. The next scripture I want you to see is Matthew chapter 25, and this is also a familiar scripture to a lot of you. It's the parable of the ten virgins, ten virgins. Now, in, in the Jewish uh, wedding custom, uh, they would have a, a procession a wedding procession that comes through the town and announcing the, the, the wedding. Usually the way it happens is there's, uh, the groom goes away 
after he makes his betrothal, after he makes, cuts the deal with the parents or whatever to marry the girl, and he, he chose her, doesn't have any relations with her, just like Joseph did with Mary, but then, you know, Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and of course it was like this question of what happened here, you know, and it was difficult for Joseph and Mary in their early life because everybody thought that Jesus was a illegitimate child, right? And so, right, so you're not supposed to have issues together, you're supposed to stay away. Then, at the right time, you go build a place added to the father's house. In other words, you go to the father's house, because that's usually everybody was in the same thing, just like the, the prodigal son came back to the father's house and the brother was still there. He hadn't moved away to Boston or anything. Right? And so, so you, you go back and you build to, add, add to the father's house and you work the land until the dad passes on, moves along. Then you, the oldest son takes the double portion, controls the family, helps the family out doesn't cut anybody out. There's more than enough for everybody because everybody grows, right? That's the father's house. And that's what he, the the, the groom goes away, builds a a place added to the father's house. And the father looks at the place and goes, "Mm, son, you need to add a little little bit more room there. You need to put a roof on it at least, you know, before you go get her. And he gives the command, it's time to go get her. Go ahead and go get her. Nobody knows when that's going to happen. And all of a sudden, he comes through the thing, picking up all his, 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 his groomsmen. They know the time and the season, and they prepare, just like the parable of the wedding feast in the Bible. But you have this, this procession coming through, blowing loud trumpets. And there's always the virgins, or the ten virgins, that go with the bride, right? Maybe family, friends, whatever, they go with the bride. And they have to be ready to go, so they have these lamps, and the lamps are on their fingers. They have like little things that dangle from their fingers, and they have these little lamps that they hold, you know, and the oil, sorry, the oil vials are on their fingers, and they hold the little lamps. Lamps are little clay lamps like this, and they barely light up the way. You really can't, not like a flashlight, you know, but, you know, at least they're ready. And, uh, and so they get ready. So here's, here's what happens. It's in the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. They didn't put the little flasks of oil on their, on their fingers to, to hold them over. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, 2,000 years, right? Delaying. When's the Lord coming? The Lord said he was going to be here. I don't know why. Man, he should be here. Better be here in 10 minutes or I'm not a Christian anymore. <laughs> no, it's not like that. You wait, you wait, you anticipate whether it happens today, tomorrow, or after I move on, right? It doesn't matter. One day, or no, one way or another, we're going to see him. Now, the bridegroom was delaying. They got all drowsy and began to sleep. In other words, all 10 of them went to sleep. They all kind of went, oh, you know. He says, but at midnight, there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. In other words, here he comes. Boo, the trumpets are blowing. It's time. Come on, let's go. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, got their lamps lit up and trimmed and ready to go. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will be not enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So when people start telling you, oh, it's May 14th, and it's April 8th, you know, the eclipse. And no, he might come right now. Before you guys get impatient with me, at 12.05, he might come, all right? Just so you know. And so uh, understand here. So, so first of all, realize some things. It's dangerous not to be ready. So question number one, how do we get ready? How do we get prepped, if you will? Well, and this question number two, how do we stay ready? How do we stay prepped and ready to go? Number one, understand your position. Understand your position. Are you in Christ? Ask yourself that, am I in Christ, and is Christ in me? Those are the two questions you can answer. Am I in Christ, and is Christ in me? Have I emptied myself of me and let him in? And have I surrendered myself to him? Right? Ask those questions. 
Second of all, how do we stay prepped? We seek his presence. We seek his place where he is. Where do you find Jesus Christ? In the words that are in the Bible. You'll find Jesus in every single book of the Bible, pretty much. The exception of maybe one. Every single one of the 66 books has a type of Jesus in it. And by that I mean a, 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 a shadow, a, a signature, a, some kind of a foreshadowing, a, a picture of Jesus. All right, look that up in your studies. You'll see what I'm talking about. Draw close to him. Prayer. Communication with God. His word. Read his word. Worship through reading his word. Worship in the sense of putting your mind on Christ, putting your mind on creation, putting your mind on his works, his wonderful works. Sing songs about him, psalms and songs and, and spiritual songs in, in, in your heart. And then there's fellowship. Oh, we talked about these things before. Fellowship. Fellowship is doing what you're doing today. Fellowship is doing what we did last Sunday morning when we had breakfast together. Fellowship is what we did Saturday, yesterday. By the way, Darren, good job giving us a great word yesterday. And fellowship is what the girls are going to do, the women are going to do, or, and hopefully some men too probably next Saturday. i got to hurry, guys. Sorry. My clock must be wrong. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at our scripture once again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Let's look at that real quick, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. First of all, um, let's look at this. Verse 13 says, But do not, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. So this is interesting to understand. Don't be uninformed about what's happening. The Thessalonians thought they missed the coming of the Lord. They, and then they thought that the, the people that had died in Christ, that were Christians before them that had died, they missed the Lord. So what are we going to do? You know, they, they, you know, they were kind of perplexed about this because people had maybe fed them a line. I don't know. But they, they, they obviously got the wrong intel. And verse 14 says, uh, For if we believe Christ uh, Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Two things I want you to see from verse 13 as well is to not grieve as those who have no hope. Again, I said that earlier. I'll say it again. Christians have hope. Amen? Uh, we have hope. Not only hope for us, but hope for the, the, the loved one that passed away. We'll see them again in the perfect body. Everything will be fine. No more sickness, no more death, no more disease. And then the other thing I want you to see is that they were asleep. Um, when somebody passes away, they're no longer accessible right? Um, it's just like when I take a nap, which is really rare, even though Brenda might argue. I don't take a nap very often, but when I do, I'm out. <laughs> I mean, I'm out. I'm in the bedroom. I'm out, right? The kids could be playing, doing so, right? Unless somebody calls me and wakes me or something, I'm out. I don't exist. I'm not part of the land of the living, <laughs> if you will, right? So it's, it's a metaphor for passing on, being asleep, it doesn't mean that there's such a thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as soul sleep where your soul just goes to sleep, right? No, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Jesus is going to bring with him those who had fallen asleep. Interestingly enough, the word cemetery, you know the word cemetery, right? Cemetery, place where you go bury people. Uh, it comes from a Latin word, which comes from a Greek word, which basically means a place of sleep. Now, back then, people that were put in cemeteries and not, you know, paganly reduced to whatever or done whatever with, uh, were, were basically believed to be Christians and that they would rise again. They're the ones that actually coined the phrase for people, cemeteries is where we put people that went to sleep because they just basically went to sleep to wake up again. They're going to resurrect, they'll wake up again. So, so, um, so listen. Um, non-believers, you know, place of rest, that's what it really means, place of rest, place of sleep. Non-believers, trust me, are not resting. They may be buried in the cemetery, but a non-believer is not necessarily resting. And, and I know there's a lot of people that think they are, but they're not. And so we have to leave that up to God, who went, who did, and whatever. But non-believers get no rest. Some people are definitely not resting. So who's Jesus bringing back with him? Those that fell asleep. So understand that portion of it. It's very important. Next thing. 
Verse 14, 15 says, For this I say to you by what? The word of the Lord with authority from God. This isn't something Paul dreamed up himself. He says, For this I say to you by the word of the Lord. The NLT says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. He didn't say, Well, you know, I think I heard it through somebody, you know, uh, read it in some blog, you know. <laughs> it's, it's for sure that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. We're not going to beat those that fell asleep. And that was the fear of the Thessalonians, that what happened to my dead relatives? Are they going to be able to see the Lord? And no, don't worry, time out. He says here, For the Lord himself it says, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They get to go first. Amen? So, so whether you died at sea or whether you died in a fire and got totally consumed, maybe your body was cremated, doesn't matter. God will put back the pieces very easily. He created the universe with a spoken word. He'll have no problem getting you, okay? So here we have, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to see the Lord in the air. Says, but here it says, we, 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 we will not ace out those that are sleeping because they ain't really sleeping. <laughs> They're absent from the body, present with the Lord. They're, they're just sleeping to us, but they're not sleeping before the Lord, okay? And, and, uh, and here it says, not just angels. It says, uh, verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. So it's not just sending his angels to get people. And the end, at the end of time, if some people argue that this is uh, other different situations there, that the angels are to come and sort out the good and the bad, uh, at the end of time, they're going to sort out the bad. Oh, yes, they will. Angels are coming to get the bad people out of the way of the earth. They're going to pluck out the bad, the evil ones, and leave the good ones to keep going, the ones that are following God. But, uh, but in this case here, it says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God First, the Christians who have died, or those who have been asleep in Christ, right, uh, will rise. It says, uh, we'll have, sorry, I messed up here. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves, right? Then verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. A shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. Do a study on the trumpet of God on the last trump. 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump, it says we should not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. At the, at the last trump, in the twinkling of an eye, right? All that, right? That's, that's what it's talking about. The dead will rise first, reunited with a new body. Together with them we are, who are alive and remain on earth. Now, in, in, verse, um, in verse 17, it says, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always, always be with the Lord. The word caught up is the word harpaso in the Greek, which means snatched violently, grabbed violently, okay? It's used many, many times in Scripture, I think 16 times, I believe, and every time it really means like a violent grabbing or taking away or, or removing from one place to another. So, for instance, Philip in, in Acts chapter 8 was baptizing the eunuch, Right, the guy that was wanting to know about Isaiah and and what about Christ, and he gave his life to Christ, and and Philip baptized him in the river right there. Boom, you know, he come out of the river as soon as Philip come out of the water. Boom, he got harpazoed, he got caught up. It says he got harpazoed and taken up to Samaria. All of a sudden, he found himself in Samaria. How did that happen? I don't know. That used to happen to Elisha all the time. I mean, Elijah all the time. Elijah would be like there. All of a sudden, he'd be like somewhere else, you know. So God can do it. God can move it. Even while you're alive, he can do that. So especially back then, in this situation, talking about that he's coming to get the people from the earth, he says, then we who are alive and will remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So the Lord Harpazo in the Latin, because of the translated... The New Testament was translated into Latin at one point, called the Vulgate, which was like the Bible of the day for about a thousand years, right? And, uh, and, and, when, and when they translated that word, they named it uh, Rapturus, Rapturus in the Latin. I don't know how to speak Latin, but it's Rapturus. And, and what that came out of that, when we talk about the doctrine of the rapture, people say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. True, neither is the word Bible, <laughs> right? 
But rapturos is caught up, is harpazo, only it's in the Bible. It's just in the Greek and in the, and the words that we've translated to, caught up, which is a very good translation. Where? In the clouds, not gazillion miles somewhere else or underneath the earth or somewhere else, paradise. No, it says in the clouds. We'll meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be a meeting in the air in a sweet, sweet by and by. I know I long to meet you over there in that land beyond the sky. Such singing we will hear, never heard by mortal ear, will be glorious, I do declare, right? And God's own Son will be the leading one in the meeting in the air. <laughs> Good. I can't wait. Okay, I'm so sick of this place, so sick of this world. I'm not sick of you guys. I love you guys, but I'm sick of... <laughs> Sounds weird when you say you're sick of this place. I'm like, Good, get out of here. <laughs> we'll get a new pastor that ain't sick of us. <laughs> No, I'm sick of the, 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 the suffering and the hurt and the pain and all the, the, the death and destruction and things that don't belong. Right? That in God's world, it's not going to be that. So meet in the, the Lord in the air. Knowing this, listen, knowing this, I'm closing. Knowing this, what can we do? Knowing this, that this is going to happen. It says here right after that, it says, therefore comfort one another with these words. It doesn't say scare each other with these words. It doesn't say ignore each other with these words is to remind each other hey the lord's going to come maranatha the lord's here almost, you know encourage one another with these words and as they close all the way remind each other that jesus is coming number one be ready don't just you know don't just think about it once in a great while think about it all the time be ready we don't know the day or the hour we're not told that we know can't try to figure that out it never happened it'll be suddenly and unexpected it'll be imminent right maranatha be prepared are you ready am i ready i'm not talking about food and beans and bullets and all this other stuff that's good too but that's not what this is talking about be ready for him you're not going to need your ak <laughs> when you go to heaven really <laughs> you won't uh, look forward to the taking. Look forward to the coming of the Lord. Look, look forward to going home. Amen. And, and, uh, and you can be in that number. There's an old song uh, that says, when the saints come marching in. Right? Remember that song? When the saints come marching in. Um, and it says, oh, I want to be in that number. When the saints come marching in. I want to be in that number. I want you to be in that number. There's one way you can be assured of that, and that's to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not maybe someday tomorrow, next week, next month, whenever, but bow your head today and say, today I want to accept Jesus Christ. I want to accept what he did on Calvary for me. I want to live for him because he died for me. I want to give him my future. I also want to give him my past because it's a mess and he needs to clean it up and take it away. And I'm going to give him my present because I want to do whatever he tells me to do today. If he wants me to share with a neighbor or do this or do that, whatever it takes, I'll do whatever it takes today. And there's no better place to be than be in the center of his will. Right? It's like being in that sweet spot of life. It just happens. And whatever comes your way, storms may come and go and and challenges and things and heartbreaks and all that kind of stuff, your focus is a lot higher. Your, your vision is a lot higher. You're putting your, your faith in something that is a lot bigger than our circumstances right here. Eternity is for a long, long time. And you want to be with Jesus. Let's, let's stand and bow our heads for a moment. Mm -mm. that scare you <laughs> Lord we want to be with you Lord and uh, we also live this life that we're in here that we're challenged by different things different situations heartbreaks and loss and, and sometimes um, moments of joy moments of sorrow but we uh, walk through this land we walk through this world and, and we need help and just like the song says when we put our faith in you it is well with my soul it is well whatever happens though Satan should buffet though things should come our way my sin that I 
dealt with for so long is gone, nailed to the cross. Lord, we're looking forward to that day when you come back, when you split that sky, and you come take us home. Lord, I want everybody here to be in that number. I want to recognize everybody as we're going up. I want our loved ones that are buried in these cemeteries, these places of sleep for the Christian. We'll see them as they go up before we do, and we'll recognize them. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds so we'll ever be with the Lord. Lord, today's the day. I want everyone here to surrender. It's hard for guys to surrender. It's hard for some people to surrender. But know that your sins can be forgiven. You can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And you can live for him. As we let Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, into our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.